Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by Snowflake, otherwise known as Jaoj, and Mr. J.C. Abbott. Today, we're discussing an update to the lawsuit facing Chad Kelly and the Toronto Argonauts. The latest edition of my mock draft. The retirement of two award-winning CFL linemen. Edmonton signing, count them, not one, not two, but three former first-round CFL draft picks. And Henry Burris landing a coaching job in the college ranks. But first. Dunk, congratulations. You have a new gig as the pre- and post-game host for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders broadcast on 620 CKRM in Regina. Let the fans know what does this mean for you personally and for your role at 3 Down Nation. Absolutely nothing's going to change at 3downnation.com. JC, thanks for the congratulations. But we're just getting started here with these pregame and postgame shows that we're going to be doing for CKRM. And it means that I'll be making some more trips out to Rider games. I'll be there for all of the home games to take in Rider Nation. So I'm actually really excited about the project we're working on. I don't want to reveal too many of the details but you guys will see as it progresses along, I'll have Wes Cates alongside me and a cast of characters to ideally create the best pre and post game show bar none in the CFL. So I know there was some chatter online about this, wondering if this meant that I was leaving 3 downnationcom That is absolutely not the case. If anything, I think this is going to be a boost to the website overall, and we are still going to aim to do what we always do, that's cover the league in an unbiased way and do the best possible job of that on a day-in, day-out basis. But Justin, I have a question, which is how could you take this job despite the fact that you have always hated the Saskatchewan Rough Riders? Because that's what <laughs> that's what social media has been telling me all day. I've been saying, how could this – no, but Justin Duck has always hated the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. So how could you do this? You know, that was the first thing that our colleague Joel Gaston said. How can you simultaneously now hate and cover, I guess, the riders, for lack of a better term? And, you know, that's absolutely not the case. I think what happens, and you guys know this from the fan bases that you cover most, Hodge, you in Winnipeg and JCU and BC with the Lions, that sometimes fans don't always see the facts the way that we try to present them in an unbiased way, right? They look at their team in a very biased way and they never really want to hear anything too negative about their team even if they're doing terribly on the field cough cough the Edmonton Elks the last couple of seasons cough (laughs) cough so that to me I think is going to be the great calling card for what's planned here with the Rough Riders is that we're going to have a crew of people who are going to be honest about the team but not in an outlandish way. We're going to be critical. We're going to call it as we see it. But also, just like we would at 3 com, if the team ends up doing really well in the first season under Corey Mace, then we're going to play that up as well. So I just want fans to know, especially in Ryderville, that I'm going to give my all to this, just like I do with 3 com, but also to the other fans around the league who are dedicated readers, listeners, viewers of this website, part of your dedication has helped this site come to where it is today and also, I believe, led to some of these opportunities that the three of us, quite frankly, have had, right? To go to the CFL Combine regularly, to go to Touchdown Atlantic regularly, to go to the Grey Cup regularly. And when we have those conversations, fellas, I think you would agree, We talk about how we're going to put out the best content possible for those big trips, but also we do those every single day as well. So I'm still going to continue with my role in 3 downnationcom as ever, but I'm going to bring that energy to these broadcasts as well. And I think that will help, I don't want to say legitimize because I think that's the wrong word here, but further the brand of 3 downnationcom and its legitimacy in this country and even south of the border. You mentioned the crew there, Duncan. I think the other part of this story is the announcement by CKRM that Dave Thomas will be the new play-by-play voice of the Riders. What can fans expect from him in that role? He is a total pro, man, and he is a guy that 
was born and raised in Saskatchewan in these borders. He's from Weyburn, Saskatchewan, which has apparently a crazy list of people that were born there, including Brett Jones. I'm just going to pull up the list that he sent me. Brendan Labatt, Graham Dillette, Tiger Williams, and W.O. Mitchell in no particular order. Like from a town the size of Weyburn to have that many notable people along with Dave Thomas is pretty incredible. But Dave Thomas is not a guy that's going to pump his own tires at all. I've called games with him in the Canada West for multiple seasons now. He's a total pro. He's a guy that knows the University of Saskatchewan Huskies program inside and out because he called their games on the radio on CJWW for years, going way back there. And he's very well known in Saskatoon as a morning man on the radio as well. But he's never a guy that's going to trumpet himself. And I think, to be quite honest, and talked about this a little bit with Dave, that having this spotlight of being the play-by-play guy for the riders is going to take some getting used to for him. But I've said it to him in the past. I said, this is something that I believe that you can do, even if maybe you don't believe it yourself. So I think he is going to be very good in the role. He's a total pro. He's going to be prepared. And I'm excited to see how he does in this new endeavor in his career. Well, it's exciting. I think, uh, I mean, obviously it's a great opportunity for you that I think you've earned, but it's also just a really exciting time in Ryderville. Like that's something I've really noticed since, especially Corey Mace was hired, like the whole energy, and this is just my personal sense, but from the time I've spent around Jeremy O'Day, the team's vice president of football operations and, and general manager, his whole energy has changed. He I think at times over the last couple of years has come across a little bit impersonal, a little bit stressed. And now he's like a kid who's learned to love football again. Like That is the energy that I get from Jeremy O'Day. That stress, that anxiety is gone. Um, And again, this is just my take on, on what I've seen, but obviously he seems to be excited about what the club has going. They've added a lot of really exciting free agents. As we've talked on this show, I was a huge fan of the signing of AJ Olette because running backs matter. And um, along with some of the other <laughs> signings, a, a super hot one, one of my favorite players in the league, Jermarcus Hardrick, who I think is going to jack up the energy there at Mosaic Stadium in Regina for fans there. So this is a very cool development and um, we wish you all the best. Who's who's going to be more fired up on game day? You think it's going to be Jamarcus Hardrick or Justin Dunn? Because I'm not sure. That's that's a tight battle. My, my prediction days. is that at some point this year, Jamarcus Hardrick will pick Justin up and put him on his shoulder and walk around, Jesus. whether it's a practice <laughs> or a game. Because that is something that Jamarcus loves to do. He does it during the game. He does it before the game. So don't be surprised. Because Dunk, I mean, he doesn't weigh that much, right? Like, like that would not no, be just a, a little wiener, man. Be, Maybe on the post game <laughs> panel, he'll pick that would not me be a struggle for the big man. Parade me around. I'll give you guys a little nugget. I was talking to Craig Reynolds and he said that news as he calls them, but new season ticket sales are up for the riders. So clearly adding Corey Mace as the head coach and the fervor that he came in with and talking about, you know, multiple times in interviews and I want this effing job. We had that exclusive story on three donation.com as he was being hired really shows the excitement around Mace. And I think, yeah, Jeremy O'Day has become more comfortable in that general manager's chair. Now, we've talked a lot about the riders off the top here, and we'll get into some other stuff later. But I want the people of 3 nationcom to know that we are still going to cover all of the teams as we usually do. I myself personally might do a little bit more riders coverage outside of my commitments to CKRM and what I'm doing with the pregame and postgame shows. But this is not going to change anything at 3 at all. It's still going to be the same, I think, great site that's held to a high standard. And I think you guys would agree with that. Absolutely. For sure. There has been a development in the Chad Kelly lawsuit as an amended statement of claim has fi- was filed by the team's former strength and conditioning coach on Tuesday, April 2nd. The file obtained by 3 Nation includes new claims surrounding Kelly's alleged attempt to get the plaintiff to stay overnight at group accommodations after a Buffalo Bills game, as well as his persistent attempts to hang out with her privately in the year that followed. Kelly's agent, Chris Lambiris, provided Three Down Nation with the following statement, quote, We look forward to our statement of defense speaking for itself, close quote. 
Kelly's lawyer, Nancy M. Shapiro, saying a statement, we do not believe the, cl the claims made against Mr. Kelly have any merit, and we are taking steps to defend the action. None of the new allegations or those contained in the original lawsuit have been tested in court. But, Dunk, what does this mean for this case? It's really just an update to the plaintiff here overall. And I think Lamburis in his statement kind of ring true to me here that we're going to have to see when they file their statement of defense and the Argos have filed an intent to file a statement of defense. There's a lot of legal jargon here to work through. So hopefully we're making this understandable in our reporting for the readers at 3 downnationcom But really, I think this still has a long way to play out. We reached out to the CFL for a comment. They said they will not be commenting until their independent investigation. They hired an outside third-party investigator to go through that. They will not comment until that is over. We reached out to the Argos and have not yet heard back from them in terms of an update on these new claims in the lawsuit. And also, we reached out to the team lawyers for the Argos and have not heard back from them as well. So we're covering all of our bases here. And I believe doing a top shelf job of covering this as straight news. And that's how it needs to be covered. People out there can take it one way or the other, but there is still a lot of this case, I believe, to be played out because really, except for a couple of statements, one that was tweeted and then deleted by Chad Kelly and now one from his lawyer and his agent, we haven't heard his full side of the story here. And I would imagine that that is going to come in the somewhat near future. But to me, guys, what stands out is the timeline, right? Training camps are going to open in May. That is approaching, you know, just over a month away now. So the CFL at some point here is going to have to make a decision. And I think the pressure is really ramping up on Randy Ambrosi. Yes. And that to me is the real story here. Ambrosi was not made available during the CFL combine. Um, so we were hoping to get uh, some comment on on where the and I wasn't expecting, obviously, details regarding the investigation itself, but maybe an update simply regarding the timeline of the investigation. Where does this stand? Does the league expect to have a verdict at any point, you know, in, in a particular timely fashion? And that was not a uh, possibility. And so uh, I do not have much to add here because I'm not going to speculate regarding this particular Issue, though I will say kudos to you, Dunk, for not only getting the updated reporting, but also getting the statement from Kelly's agent and from Kelly's lawyer. Um, the only statement, as you said, was from Kelly himself, which was subsequently deleted off social media like an hour after it got posted. So interesting new allegations. I would encourage our readers to check out the full article at 3Down. We've got more details from the lawsuit than we will uh, describe here. So make sure you check out the column posted Wednesday, April 10th. Um, it'll be on Dunk's social media feed as well as ours, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, the allegations are very serious, but Kelly's defense is also very strongly worded in that they think that these allegations are completely false. So I'm very interested to see what comes of this. I just wish that we had an update in terms of what that timeline would be, because as Dunk mentioned, you're going to blank and boom, training camp is going to be underway all across the country. And we know from what uh, Mike Pinball Clemens, the team's general manager, said at the Combine that they're planning, right? They're preparing as though Kelly will be the starter mm -hmm. But we still don't obviously know if that's going to be the case. Yeah. Ambrosi, when I spoke to him shortly after these allegations came to light, was fairly adamant that this independent investigation would be done, in his words, done when it was done right. So he didn't put a timeline on this, but the nature of the season has. And if we go into training camps or, God forbid, into the regular season with this still looming over the league, it will be a story. It will be a negative story. It will be a dark cloud over the 2024 season, regardless of what ends up happening in the lawsuit. There needs to be some sort of movement on the league side here in the next month 
understanding all the intricacies of this and how difficult that investigation must be. The one other thing I'll highlight here is, yes, there were new explanations or new details about what the nature of the harassment may have been over the year leading up to the final incident. But the other part of this new claim uh, was changing exactly how the parties are liable here. And, and now, originally in the document, there was two sections, right, or in the lawsuit. There was Kelly's section for his harassment, asking for $50,000. And then there was a whole other section focused on the Argos in terms of wrongful termination, but also a number of other employment-related allegations like unpaid overtime and things of that nature. Now, in this new version of the document, Kelly is jointly liable for the Argos for that much larger sum in terms of the potential wrongful termination. And the plaintiff also makes clear that she's seeking a significant statement from the court and punitive damage, damages from Kelly because of this harassment, right? So there's a potential here. I know when this lawsuit initially came out, a lot of people remarked that the figure wasn't that large. The monetary uh, ask was not enormous. But I think Kelly could be on the hook for a little bit more money than was originally asked for in the initial lawsuit. And punitive damages, as we know, can be up to the court's discretion. So I think that monetary ask has changed both in the way it's constructed and what the, the punishment could be if Kelly is found to have committed any of these allegations in court. That's a great point, JC, about the monetary possibilities of this case from the plaintiff's perspective. If these claims are proven true, a lot of that is going to be decided by the court in terms of how much money potentially Chad Kelly or the Argos would have to play. Again, that's looking down the line if these indeed are proven true. But you mentioned the statement there, and I think it's worth reading because this really jumped out to me when I got the documents. As the lawsuit reads, quote, Chad is a high profile athlete, won the most outstanding player award of the CFL in 2023, and is a role model to Canadian football fans. Given his important profile, Chad's conduct deserves special reprimand from the court to send out a message that women must be treated with respect and Canadian courts will not tolerate behavior similar to Chad's, close quote. That is obviously a claim being made by the plaintiff, the former strength and conditioning coach in this updated amendment, we'll call it, to the lawsuit. But I think it speaks volumes when you look at the monetary aspect versus this statement. I think that in this case, she wants this to have a long-lasting impact if her claims are proven true for workplace treatment of women in sports and not even just sports, but everywhere. And guys, there was one other thing that I wanted to get to because you gave me some kudos and that's all fine, well, and good, but we're doing great work here because we do it as a team. You guys were instrumental in putting this piece together, pointing out multiple places as to how it could be better getting this article to the point that it is and i just want to peel back the curtain a little bit for some of the readers out there that you know especially with these high profile articles or columns whatever you want to call them we go over every single word all three of us and we seek outside input as well to make sure that it is the best kind of journalism that you're going to get on the CFL. So full kudos to you guys for holding me accountable. And JC, you were the one at the start of this that said, we need to cover this case to the absolute best of our ability. And that was great because it gave me a challenge. You know, I don't think I actually said this to you offline, but I'll say it on the podcast. I think that was something that set the bar for us. We will continue to cover this case. Whatever happens with it, in the best unbiased way possible. Agreed. And who needs a copy editor when you're all copy editors? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you Hod, you're kind of the main copy editor, though, yeah. I would say. I Well, yeah, but fair. Um, I've also read some of my copy back after the fact and gone, Ooh, wish we had a real copy editor, but that's okay. <laughs> we do our best with what we got. But not on this case. On this case, it is... 
it is the full bore of what we are capable of. And, and I am proud of the work that we've done. That's like a rookie, though, looking back at his first year film compared to, you know, being 10 years in, right? Like you're being hard true. on yourself, Hodge. True, true. Um, and generally, I will say, I, I think I'm pretty good when it comes to uh, the first draft. And uh, but, but anyway, it, uh, when it comes to something like this, obviously, there is no room for first drafts. There is just the facts and laid out in a responsible, fair manner. And I, I agree that we've done a good job of that so far, at the risk of sounding self-congratulatory. Hodge, man, you moved University of Cincinnati and former NFL linebacker Joel DeBlanco to first overall in your latest CFL mock draft. I can just hear the reactions in, I'm not going to call them what some other people like to call them all the time, but draft rooms around the CFL. What is Hodge know? What is Hodge know? <laughs> Replacing receiver Nick Mardner. Why did you make the switch? I did have a couple people who I, I talked to on a regular basis around the league where, well, I, I mean, I asked this question to a lot of people um, and some of them answered it for me. The question was, who do you think is going first overall? Uh, a few people answered it and a few people merrily said, well, that depends. I, I'll, I'll wait for your mock draft and then we'll see. Um, <laughs> see. Admittedly, I did get the first overall pick of last year's draft, Dante Bull, albeit late in the process. Um this time around, I had Nick Mardner going first overall in my original mock draft. I do still think that Nick Mardner would be a great fit for the Elks. I do think that Edmonton needs to upgrade the Canadian talent in its receiving core, and Mardner certainly fits the bill from a Edmonton Elks scouting standpoint. Six foot six, two hundred eight pounds, unbelievably long. Um, not necessarily a burner, but still somebody who is fast in space. And for someone of his size, has solid quickness. He's a former John Cornish Trophy finalist, former Mountain West Honorable Mention selection when he was at the University of Hawaii. He finished his collegiate tenure at Auburn and previously was at Cincinnati for one year. And I think that his lack of production there probably killed his NFL interest, but certainly CFL teams will be drooling and foaming at the mouth to get this guy into their facility. So why move him down the board? I've now got him going fifth to Toronto. The reason is Joel DeBlanco. I think that if I'm the Edmonton Elks, I need someone who's going to help me right now. And there's not a lot of players available in a CFL draft like that, right? This is not a league where guys get drafted and then start at quarterback week one, as we often see south of the border. This is a league where your Canadian players usually need to cut their teeth on special teams for a year or two or work their way up as, you know, the, the, the reserve O lineman and then the sixth O lineman and then they get the opportunity to start. And Joel DeBlanco out of Cincinnati, I think, is a rare player who can start right away. And whether or not the Elks keep the first overall pick, because as we know, the Elks are open to trading this selection, I think DeBlanco will be the first overall pick um, because he is somebody who can start right away. This is a player the Ottawa Red Blacks tried to sign as an American. And uh, obviously, upon learning that he was Canadian, they... Uh, he had to go in the draft. So to me, DeBlanco answered every question. I'm not going to reiterate all of my thoughts from the combine. Didn't because those the are Red Blacks on the record from the kind pod. of find Alex Singleton the same way? Yeah, the Red Blacks have kind of and gotten Jordan hammered Williams. over the years. Yeah, and kind Jordan of gotten Williams. The like, they're yeah, on they, a roll here a really... with these, what should we call them, Canadian-American linebackers? Some people call them fake Canadians, but I don't think so. Pseudo Canadians. I, like I, I will say there are also some teams in the league who are – Greatly appreciative of the fact that the Ottawa Red Blacks have done a lot of this legwork. <laughs> There's also some teams who are upset with other clubs that maybe don't like to get into the sandbox and play with everybody else, but instead try to hide players for themselves. Uh, one of those players was DK Bonham, allegedly, um, though, of course, Bonham denied those allegations. There's also some thoughts that there might be some other pseudo Canadians, fake Canadians, whatever you want to call out there in the world that uh, some teams are trying to keep under wraps. But uh, anyways, right now, I think DeBlanco is the first overall pick. Some teams uh, yes, are one Niles team. Yes, Niles Morgan. Uh, okay, admittedly, it's just one team. Um, <laughs> and I'll let, uh, I'll let our listeners speculate as to which team that is. Um, but to me, is DeBlanco is a guy who's ready. Something 2.0. Sorry, Hodge. This is just going all over my mind. What did they call that when he was in Ryderville? Something. Something, something, two point. Chicken oh, you, squad. You talk about the. 
Oh, the no, expanded it was the practice uh, expanded squad. practice roster. No, but yes, there was a name uh, for it. Taxi squad? I think it was chicken squad because part of what was going on there was they were competing for fried chicken. That sounds yeah, that, that rings a bell. That rings I a remember bell. If it was called Chicken Squad or what it was called. Sorry, I'll there stop was also interrupting you, but it just comes to mind. It's kind of funny. Maybe you had too many uh chicken wings and gray goose to remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but regardless, um I think DeBlanco is ready to come in and start. And yes, Edmonton has a great middle linebacker right now in Niles Morgan. Though my, Niles Morgan has had trouble staying healthy. I think Niles Morgan is also very capable of, of playing at will. I also think Joel DeBlanco could play well. He ran a four five nine laser at the Combine. And I think the fact that he has family in Edmonton is a little bit of an added bonus. I did have some people question, is Chris Jones really going to take the son of two pastors? And I said, hey, Chris Jones took a linebacker out of the RSEQ first over, or a second overall last <laughs> year as a French Canadian, which I don't think anybody expected to happen. And it did because he's a long linebacker who can really run. And if you're willing to take Michael Rodrigue second overall, I think you're certainly willing to take Joel DeBlanco first overall. But again, that's if Edmonton keeps the pick. I do think that there's a possibility that another team who needs linebacker help could trade up here for Joel DeBlanco, in which case Edmonton could do what they did two years ago, where Tyrell Richards was the consensus top player and the Montreal Alouettes came in at the last, set, last second to make that trade. And there has been a little bit of buzz about a trade possibly happening. I've personally asked all of the scouts and personnel folks in my Rolodex not to do any trades because that messes up my mock draft. Um, <laughs> and none of them were, uh, you couldn't were, project were willing a trade to commit in your to mock that. Drafts. Yeah, but none of them were willing to commit to not making a trade, which I, I found a little bit disrespectful. But I, <laughs> I, I also at the same time appreciate that uh, they got to do what they got to do. After that, I've got Kevin Metal at number two, moving up from 11. And then Jeffrey Canton Arcu going to the Riders at three. And I do think there's a chance that three line, linebackers go in the top three of this draft after Canton Arcu had a somewhat disappointing pro day, only running 485 after believing that he would run much faster. I've talked to Canton Arcu since then. He said that some scouts did have him in the four sixes and that he's not yet received his official time from Memphis. Uh, but regardless, uh, he's somebody who is now probably more of a CFL guy than an NFL guy, which will be the music to CFL evaluators ears, which is, of course, the way in which this draft is bizarre and unlike any other. The worse you run, sometimes the higher you get drafted, because if you run unbelievably well, you're going to the NFL, kid. And if you don't, all of a sudden, you could be available to CFL teams right away. Every time I think of Kevin Mattel, I think of Andy Petrillo's little rhyme she came up for with him during the Vanier Cup when he was the MVP. I can't remember it right now. But it's like, if you play for Laval and you need a play, call Kevin Mattel or something like that. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, By the way, it was way better, do you guys, but I can't remember. Do you guys want to know uh, who playing corner and safety covered Kevin Mattel at the Sejep level. And the easy answer is Benjamin Labrosse. So don't bring that. We already know that. Who was playing at the Sejep level, same time as Kevin Mattel, and would cover him as corner and safety? Was it Canton Arku? Yes, it was. Oh, nice. Well nice. done. Jeffrey Canton Arku is now, well, Memphis lists him as 240. He weighed in at 230. At his pro day, but at the Sejep level, uh, I'd have to double check where he, uh, Sejep Garneau, that's where he went. Uh, he was not only playing against Kevin Mattel, but would go to battle with Kevin <laughs> Mattel. So it would be wild if they were two of the top three picks in this year's draft, as I've mocked. But as always, it is just a mock draft. Some of these picks will be very close to accurate. Some, dare I say, will be exactly accurate. But inevitably, there will be some that uh, that don't age the best. But it's the mock. It is what it is. Hopefully, mock 3.0 will be out right before the draft with all correct picks. Who was that he, guy that Brock Sunderland took out of nowhere in the first round? Cole, Cole, Nelson. Cole Nelson. That's who it was. Who, it shocked everybody. Who it was. But I will say, Cole Nelson played. He was. He's obviously a DT at Alberta with the Golden Bears. I don't think had a single sack his entire U Sports career. But he played offensive tackle during the preseason last year, and I thought he looked really good. He's also maybe the biggest. And then person started I've ever like ten games in my tackle. 
Uh, that's not true, but he, yeah, did, he did. He did play quite a bit. No, no, he didn't start at, at yeah, JT. He did. But he did. Okay, <laughs> look it check, up. check check your notes, Hodge. Face off. I got him right oh, here. Boy. I, I had okay. I had this debate with someone. At- Dunk, what's what's your over under? Cole Nelson starts. JC said ten. Yeah. I don't recall him starting ten games. I'll say my over under or my number. Uh, give us a number. I'll say he maybe started, not even maybe, because I'm going to give you a number. Three games. My guess would have been three. The actual answer is six. So we oh. are more correct than JC, but that is more than I thought, JC. Fair enough. But JC Jamin went Pelly over, started so if three. this is a price is right, he is eliminated. He busted. Hodge. He does what not get. Look at my 70 years old. He's trying to win a truck, buddy. Is right? Come on now. <laughs> I, I will say this. You mentioned the question, what does Hodge know? To me, my favorite question that we get asked at the Combine isn't that. It's when personnel people come up to us and say, so who are we picking? Because there's certain <laughs> teams where, you know, it's you know it's a joke. It's said tongue-in-cheek. And then there's other teams like, are you really asking? Because it seems like you might need some advice. And we're happy to provide it. So, Maybe it's a little life imitates art sometimes with these mocks, Hodge. You're giving them uh, the insight that they need to make the correct Maybe. selection. Can I tell a story and real quick? The, and, then, and then there's the occasional teams who don't even make eye contact with you and just pretend that you don't exist, which <laughs> hurts my feelings a little bit, but that's okay. Yes, Dunk, go ahead. We're all just people, man. Like, Can we all just get along? So And like ni- and I will say 90, 90 plus percent of them are cool. There's just, there's just a handful. Anyways, keep going. Yeah, the haters, they'll turn eventually. It's okay. I can't remember the year this was, and Hodge, maybe you can look this up as I'm going along, but Marcel Desjardins and the Red Blacks, I think it was when they picked Evan Johnson. And that was back when I was still doing mock drafts. That was 2017. And I remember having that in my final mock draft, I think. Maybe that was the final one I ever did because, honestly, I got sick and tired of pouring hours and hours and (laughs) texts and calls and hugs. You know what it's like. Because the the tricky part with these mock drafts is we're trying to give the best representation of what we think will actually happen, not – what we think the teams should do in terms of their mm. pick. So I think it was that year with Evan Johnson. I had somebody within the Red Blacks organization tell me that Desjardins called a meeting. And he got so mad wondering how their pick got out. And Evan Johnson was a uh, bit down the list in the middle of the first round, if I remember right. And he was the last pick of the first round. He went ninth overall. Last pick of the first round. Maybe I'm misremembering it. But anyways, Desjardins, point of the story, was was so mad and was trying to find out who from his organization had told me that they were going to pick, in this case, Evan Johnson, if that's even the right pick. And that's why I say, Hodge, when the mock draft comes out, that people around the league in these draft rooms, can we please call them draft rooms? Can we agree on that? Can we all agree on that? Yeah, that's fine. Sure. Okay. I just think it's way more respectable than calling it a war room because a, a war doesn't go on in there. Okay. Those are... <laughs> Much different things. In these draft rooms, people start freaking out because they know that in this instance, with John and especially JC, that they have so much information, not only from the prospects and on the prospects themselves, but from people around the league, that they are doing their own mock drafts. But truth is, and they're probably lying to you if they say no, the majority, if not all of the personnel people involved in the draft are reading John Hodge's mock drafts. I guarantee you because they'll tell you they go through this exercise by themselves trying to figure it out. But then some of them will tell you, well, you know, we go through these exercises and then, you know, a Cole Nelson pick happens and that throws everything off because you never really know what's going to happen until draft day, which is part of the fun of it. Yeah. And by the way, I don't think that Marcel needed to panic because the fact that he was taking the best available offensive lineman was not a surprise to anybody. <laughs> he did it every year for five years in a row, even when he did not need an offensive lineman. It became easy to he figure out. He would take out. the best one available. It's, it's uh, remar- Remarkably so. He took Al- – we'll write it down. I got it pulled up here. He took Alex Mateus, number one, in, in round one in 15. That was a good pick. 16, he took uh, Jason Lazance again at 7. Again, that was a good pick. In 17, he took Evan Johnson at 9. That was a pretty good pick. In 18, he took Mark Cordy at 4. 
that was a good pick. And then in 2019, this is the year he kind of made a mistake. He took Alex Fontana out of Kansas, despite the fact that the O-line there was loaded Mm -hmm. and Fontana was a center. And um, that, I think, is why they steered away from going O-line in the future because they had other positions that they had not addressed. Uh, But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that was, that was hardly difficult to mock that, that Marcel was probably taking Evan Johnson or the best available O lineman because the only one off the board at that point was Jeff Gray. The best part was that he got so mad and I heard about it. It was kind of funny. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, going back to the mock itself, I I do want to point out that, I think Hodge got this exactly right at the top. I, I don't see anybody except DeBlanco going number one anymore. And I'll give credit where credit is due to uh, our colleague, uh, Dwayne Ford, for this particular line. But he likes to say, find the unicorn. And if there's a unicorn in this draft, it's Joel DeBlanco, right? We talk about a guy who's getting comp to Alex Singleton because of the similar path that they've been on, but was an exceptional, exceptional player at Cincinnati for a team that as a group of five school went to the college football playoff. He's a guy who has NFL experience, doesn't have to start for you day one, but certainly can at either of those true linebacker spots. So Hodge, I think you, you made the smart move in switching those picks. And really, I, I don't see any spot in that first round where I go, ah, I don't see this happening or this is the wrong selection really point by point all the way down the draft board. I think you did an excellent job. That makes for a boring well, podcast, and- man. If we're all agreeing here, do the <laughs> Elks really need the Blanco? Yes. Yes. Why, why don't they like, do they really though? Yes. Yes. Why did you watch them play last year? But that's what I'm talking about. Like, do they need him or could they use a guy like, Oh, well, I don't know. Kevin Mattel to help with that receiving core even more. They don't have Stephen well, okay. Dunbar Jr. anymore. The, he, Their starting here's, linebackers here's the issue. are largely set, and DeBlanco is not going to play Sam. Here's, here's the issue. The linebacker position is not deep whatsoever. If you're going to get a top linebacker, a guy who projects as a starter, you have to get DeBlanco or Jeffrey Canton or Koo, both of whom will be gone in the first round. Receiver, there's going to be a Kevin Clarcius. There's going to be a Dell Duncan Busby. There's going to be even a Friedrich Antoine available later on for the Elks who they can grab, or maybe a super secret, quote unquote, pseudo Canadian who people don't know about yet. And- so <laughs> there are. So, so to me, like, I, I wouldn't say Mardner's a bad pick at number one, but you're going to get a really good receiver if you're Edmondson and that's the position you covet at 10. You're not going to get a starting linebacker who is akin to Alex Singleton, who, by the way, Chris Jones passed on in 2016 to take Josiah St. John, who never developed into a full-time starter. So if you're Chris Jones and you're, you you know, you you, you got a big fat fastball across the middle of the plate and you struck out, (laughs) guess what? This is your next at bat. And everybody is going to laugh at you if you pass up that second juicy pitch. Cause, and by the way, here's the other thing. As much as Marner didn't run great at his pro day, as much as I mean, he ran well. He just didn't run amazing. And as much as he had little production the last two years, he's six foot six. Somebody in the NFL is going to bring him into a mini camp. And if you go to a mini camp, there's a chance you get signed. And if you're the Elks and you take Marner number one and he goes to the NFL, you got egg on your face. Guess what? Joel DeBlanco is available right now. He's had two years to go through the NFL process. Heck, you could probably sign him to a contract before the draft even starts. Hodge, you what- took a whole bunch of eggs and threw them on a bunch of personnel people's faces in your redraft. You're probably wondering, what the heck is he talking about? I love oh, this piece exactly. because it shows CFL fans who are not draft geeks, admittedly, like the three of us, and you guys have you know, taken it to another level, I think, with our colleague there, Mr. Dwayne Ford at TSN as well. But if you look at this piece going back to 2010, I love what you did because you redraft each of the – first overall picks, and it shows you that, yeah, you can talk about these guys, like I'm not saying he's going to be a bust, but Joel DeBlanco being a surefire first overall pick, but how many times did that happen in the last over a decade, right? I think Enoch Mwamba was the only only guy that you had in here that you would take number one again. So if you look some of these drafts, it's like unbelievable to think in 2019, Shane Richards goes number one overall. Remember, everybody was drooling over him, but it's I wasn't, easy to I say. I was not either. 
I'm, I guess I should say less people in the league were. Sorry, fellas. Oh, fair I don't want to lump you in there. But if you look back now, I mean, it's easy to see this in hindsight, obviously, but it shows how much of an inexact science this is because Brady Oliveira would have clearly been the first overall pick this year. And this is where, you know, I used to hesitate to say this in the past, but, you know, I'll say it now. Some of these personnel people walk around like they know everything. Like they're going to make the exact perfect pick every single time. And this piece lays it out clear as day that that just doesn't happen. It's part of the fun and the allure of the draft. But I just wish that some of these egos were taken down a notch if they read this piece. Look at 2020. Nathan Rourke should have been the first overall pick in that draft. Yes, Jordan Williams has had you know solid career for a first overall yes. pick. But Nathan Rourke proved to be and part of this is development as well you know a generational talent who obviously has earned his way now down to the nfl and there's some argument there that you could say well he only had one real season in the cfl we'll see what happens in the future but that's all i think when i read these kinds of things and i really do respect the personnel people in the league who have the foresight to admit that they don't know everything and that the draft is a bit of a crapshoot Whereas there's some people there in the league that think that they're all knowing of everything. And I think the other point I want to get out quickly when we're talking about the draft is a lot of this comes down to where you go, how that prospect Mm -hmm. or prospects are supported and developed when they actually get to the pros. That is a vital, vital piece to their potential success. Absolutely. And and that really doesn't get talked about, about enough, Dunk. I think if you took the gro- a whole pool of busts, right, and all the guys who we think about as having flamed out were disappointed based on where they were drafting, yeah, there's going to be a couple of them who are just, you know, not worth it, right? And we can see that in hindsight. You're going to get another large section that gets injury-related, right? They got unlucky. And then there's a whole other group of people who were simply put in a bad spot. Maybe, like we talked about with the Red Blacks, Alex Fontana, Fontana, does he have a better career if he goes somewhere where he's not buried on the depth chart for as long as he was and actually gets a chance to get some playing time early in his career and go through those growing pains? Maybe he becomes a different offensive lineman later in his career through that situation. Maybe if you go to a place with a better coaching staff or a coordinator who's willing to put a Canadian on the field in, in a Trey position Ford. where teams normally don't do, right? <laughs> you you get more opportunities and you become a better player, right? There are so many things that are not necessarily on these prospects' shoulders when we use the term bust. It's sort of a stigma. And most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, I think it's outside of these guys' control. Well, and and getting back to the mock real quick, I will say I try to have my cake and eat it too a little bit because I don't exclusively call it a prediction. I do inject some personal opinion. And I also want to give JC credit because we went through the mock together and he shared a bunch of notes. So it is some of his work as well, though ultimately I was the one who put it together. Um, but as much as Dunk is ripping on Chris Jones, it should be noted <laughs> that the top pick that I had in my redraft for 2017 was Cameron Judge, who I think was considered a bit of an off-the-board pick in 2017 at second mm-hmm. overall because he didn't play that much in college, right? He was not a you know year-in, year-out starter at UCLA. And a lot of people went, oh, look, here's Chris Jones drafting this you know big school guy with great measurables. This isn't going to work out. And then... All of a sudden, after a rookie year to kind of learn the Canadian game, Cameron Judge is like one of the best defensive players of the CFL, right? Like, and he's gotten NFL looks based on what he's achieved in the CFL. So I didn't put the article together to embarrass any personnel people. And by and large, I think the personnel people in the CFL are smart and they do treat me really well and and with kindness and respect and all that, whatever, uh, which is great. Um, but yes, I did want to illustrate that this, uh, you know, the draft is the draft. And by the way, 
Anybody who wants to pretend that the CFL draft is a whole heck of a lot different than any other draft from a bust perspective needs to go back and look at old NFL drafts because every year oh there are players taken. You know, we're talking about teams with almost unlimited budgets who can do and say and research and do, do anything imaginable to analyze prospects. And they routinely take players who do nothing. Peyton Manning, the, Ryan Leaf, level. Zach Wilson. Uh, who was number one yeah. that year with Zach Wilson? Uh, Trevor Lawrence was number one that year. Like, but but you know what I'm saying? Like, the like there are guys who will go top five who do nothing. So it's not just a CFL thing. It's not just a football thing. This is a drafting thing in general. That's part of, some, in my opinion, what makes the draft. And sometimes so those fun. guys end up in the CFL, a la Robert Kimdiche. Exactly. Now, speaking of guys who probably should have gotten taken higher in their draft years, Chris Van Zyl has retired following 15 seasons in the CFL as a member of the Toronto Argonauts and Hamilton Tiger Cats after originally being drafted by the Owls. The McMaster University product was a three-time CFL All-Star, seven-time East Division All-Star, two-time Great Cup champion, and one-time CFL Most Outstanding Offensive Lineman. How will you remember Van Zyl's career? I, I think this is a perfect dovetail from our previous conversation because I will remember his career largely in the context of how unlikely it was based on how he got there, right? This is a guy who was drafted in the third round by the Montreal Alouettes as a defensive tackle, right? He was an all Canadian defensive tackle at McBaster, a damn good player on the defensive line. Comes into camp with Montreal that first year, can't quite make it, goes back to school, has another good season, comes in for a second camp, PR'd, not really finding his fit, gets cut, and ends up in Toronto where he converts to offensive line and very quickly becomes one of the best offensive linemen in the CFL and a ratio breaker at tackle. And if you go back and you look at that 2019 tape especially, a lot of times when a guy wins most outstanding offensive lineman, not to harp on our media colleagues too much, it can be a bit of a reputation award, right? We vote on it too. So, Some sometimes, yeah, yeah so, sometimes – you question the ultimate winner, whether that's really the best player along the offensive line in the league or if it's just a, a long-tenured guy. Chris Van Zyl deserved that award that year. You watch his tape. It was so clean. He was, he was so polished at that stage in his career once he got into his late 30s. It was incredibly impressive to watch. And Obviously, after the pandemic, things fell off a little bit. He got up into his 40s, didn't play a whole lot last year. But a guy with that type of longevity after changing positions and with a peak that high, to me, Chris Van Zyl should be a Hall of Famer one day. He is one of the best Canadian tackles that we've ever had. And some people might not know, JC, you touched on it there real quick, but I actually went against Chris Van Zyl in university when I was a quarterback at Guelph, and he was a defensive lineman. I'll call him defensive lineman because you can move him all over the defensive line in Canadian university football. He was an absolute terror. So when he got drafted into the CFL and I heard they're going to flip him to offensive line, I was like, man, this guy's so good. He's got long levers. He could be really disruptive inside. I thought it was maybe kind of wasting his talents on that side of the ball. But obviously, you know, those people on the coaching staff and the people in the front office that made that move to flip him over to the offensive line saw something that he could be potentially even better at. And he was a very good offensive lineman, especially as a Canadian, for a long time in this league. But I will never forget trying to block that guy, trap that guy, double team and get to the next level with that guy. Like you really could not run at him when he was with the Marauders. And he was so long that even at points when I thought I got away from him, this long arms like grabbed me in the back. And I'm like, eh, who is oh, it's Van Zyl again? Get this guy off of me. Like he's a freak, many, man, the university how level. Many, how many sacks he get on you, Doc? Oh, bro. I don't even know. I mean, I burned the interception numbers for my career, so I didn't really count the <laughs> sacks either. <laughs> how convenient. <laughs> they, they were never interceptions. They were just touchdowns that didn't happen, right? That's one way to put it. I oh, might that's steal a, that definition. It, yeah. They're just pounds I didn't lose. That's all it is. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what I'll start calling them. 
Um, but <laughs> it also serious. It all serious. This Van Zyl deserves all the credit in the world. Making a position change at the professional level, it's an extremely hard thing to do. He did it at a high level. According to StatsCrew.com, take it with a grain of salt, he started three games for the Argos in 09. So we're talking about a guy who, in the first two years of his career, started a grand total of three games. So this is not somebody who achieved immediate success at the CFL level. And that is also a nice reminder when it comes to the draft Right. I, I see people complain, well, these guys never do anything or like, well, but this guy, blah, blah. and it's like, sometimes you need to have patience. Sam Emelis is another great example. He did nothing in his rookie year with the Riders mm-hmm. and then exploded right in year two. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this season where hopefully we're going to have more of those guys across the league who have tremendous second years who were taken in last year's draft. And inevitably, there's going to be at least a small handful of guys taken in this year's draft who, after a couple of years of obscurity, we're going to be talking about a lot in 2026, 2027, and beyond. Sean Lemon announced his retirement on Wednesday morning, which seemed like a surprise considering the 35-year-old had a great year in 2023 and recently signed a contract extension. Lemon has finished his career with 237 career tackles, 101 sacks, 30 forced fumbles, and three interceptions to go along with two all-star selections and three Grey Cup rings. How will you remember the Lemonator? I'll remember the Lemonator for being able to get after the quarterback and squeeze him for some sacks, but I think what I will remember him most for is his transformation from young man to a, I don't want to say real man, but to an adult man. Because if you guys remember all the way back when he broke into the CFL, you know, had a really good season and then went down to the NFL for a little while and came back, like he was kind of viewed as a guy that, how should I put this, was potentially, you know, disruptive or out for himself. But I think his evolution speaks to him as a player being self-aware and being able to understand that, you know, as a young person, he didn't want to be that divider. He wanted to be a multiplier for his team, if you will. So that's what really stands out to me because you can remember, and I think you guys probably would too, the war of words between him and Marcel Desjardins that I think even spilled onto Twitter and there were some quotes and stuff like that. That kind of stuck in a lot of people's minds for a while, and it took him a while to battle back and fight against it to really show that he was a team guy. But he was an absolutely critical factor on that Alouettes team winning a Grey Cup, not only believing that that was actually a possibility, but changing sort of the feel around that defense and recruiting guys there like a Darnell Sankey and making sure that the whole feel, vibe, and culture around that team was one that could go on to be championship caliber. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that Lemon was very cocky at the start of his career and was out for himself. But when you talk to people around the league, I mean, Lemon is hugely influential in this league with other players, even, dare I say, personnel people and coaches. People ask for his opinion. They ask for his advice. And I do think... At the risk of hyperbole, he is somewhat of a visionary for the reasons that you laid out, Dunk. Like who, when he signed with the Alouettes, was going, oh, yeah, this is a team that can make a great cup run. It was like, no, this is a team that can make a a run to the dump. And that's just about it. Like this team is not going anywhere. (laughs) And suddenly, but but in all seriousness, they're making a run to the dump before they're making a run to the great cup. And lo and behold, they not only make a run to the great cup, but. They win the East final decisively in front of a. We get odds for that of, from our odds makers. In front of a rare hostile crowd in Toronto, a 16 win <laughs> Argos team. They embarrass that group in front of their hometown fans. And they go to the Great Cup where they're like touchdown underdogs and they just kind of shrug and they're like, no, we, we got this. And lo and behold, they play, they all played the Bombers, right? They, they, they were the better team on Great Cup Sunday. So uh, I think Sean Lemon is a huge part of that. And I give him full credit for kind of rehabilitating his image. I think that was earned. And um, the only thing that makes me really sad today about his retirement 
is that he's never going to be a member of the Hamilton Tiger Cats because famously, <laughs> when he signed with the Montreal Alouettes, I remember talking to Kevin Glenn about this, saying, hey, you know, Sean Lemon's only one team away from completing the Kevin Glenn circuit. How do you feel about that? And first of all, Kevin Glenn was all for it. He was like, man, I think that'd be cool. Like me and Sean, he's like, and then we got a quarterback, we got a D-line. He's like, we got to get a linebacker. We got to get a receiver. Like we'll, we'll, we'll keep having other people complete the circuit with all nine teams. But lo and behold, the only team he has not been a member of is the Hamilton Tiger Cats. He has been, he never dressed for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but believe it or not, that was his first pro team in 2011. The Bombers had him on the PR for uh, like a couple of months and they cut him. Uh, Joe Mack made a lot of mistakes. Cutting Sean Lemon was probably one of them. Um, and uh, he played for seven other teams, which is, uh, which is pretty sensational. So, Hey, uh, West division, most outstanding defensive player, three great cops. Take a bow, Sean Lemon. Well done. Over a hundred sacks, right? 13th overall. That is, that is crazy for the history that this league has. Yeah. The, the thing that makes me sad about this is he was just, starting in my mind to get the respect that he really deserved and athletes know when to step away when you're 35 you got to make that decision at some point but lemon's late career once he had matured once some of those personality things had been sanded off and teams began to realize that hey it doesn't really matter if he's knocking every down run defender he's a hell of a pass rusher finally getting his due finally getting a good contract in Montreal. This is a player who I think bounced around far too much for what he was as an athlete. And it it's, it's just unfortunate that he has to step away now, just when it seemed like he was peaking late in his career. It's now time for Hodges' heritage moment. On this day in 2009, Frank Morris passed away at the age of 85. The Toronto native played 14 seasons with Toronto and Edmonton at guard and defensive tackle, winning six Grey Cups as a player before winning another seven during his stint as the director of player development at Edmonton during their dynasty run of the 70s. A position he held from 1973 to 1988. He was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 1983. Dunk, could you imagine winning 13 Grey Cups? Like, at some point, where do you where do you even put the rings? You you run out of fingers. <laughs> you start putting them on your toes, I guess, bro. That's insane, man. Like I just wanted to get one Yates Cup for heaven's sakes, let alone thirteen <laughs> gray cups. You know, it's the old adage of like the rookie that's on a championship team. And I think of the Andrew Harris documentary right now because it's top of mind. Harris won a gray cup in his first year in the league with the BC Lions, and he's like, "This is just what we're going to do every year." But that's not the case, although Frank Morris showed that's actually possible. <laughs> you can do it every year. Yeah. Morris, obviously a Hall of Famer, a Wall of Honor guy in Edmonton, remarkably successful, but a real renaissance man. Like This is a guy who got to start in football during World War II with those Navy teams, had the success he did as a player, had the success he did as an executive but was also like a really good baseball pitcher. He played hockey at a high level. He was a musician. He was an artist. He was a photographer. Like this guy literally did it all and was revered by people around the league and in Edmonton and Toronto. So the guys are Renaissance men. Yeah, there is, there's, they don't make them like Frank Morris anymore. And, and you say that a lot, but they truly do not. When Morris passed away in Edmonton in 2009 at the age of 85. But interestingly enough, when Googling him for the purposes of the show, when you Google Frank Morris, one of the first things comes up is a different Frank Morris born in 1926 <laughs> who escaped from Alcatraz. So maybe Frank Morris, Whoa. in addition to all of his other Renaissance doings, did escape from Alcatraz, <laughs> pinned it on a different person of the same name, and then just went about his life winning great cups. Maybe, maybe. We'll never know. Epic. Let's get to the three-minute drill, fellas. Andrew Harris plans to sign a one-day contract with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to officially retire as a member of the team. Is that fitting to end his career? I think it is going back to his hometown team, and I'm looking forward to talking to Andrew about it at the premiere of his documentary, which will happen later this month in Winnipeg. University of Memphis linebacker Jeffrey Canton Arku ran a 4.85 second 40-yard dash at his recent pro day. JC, we talked about it a little bit earlier. 
Is that going to help his draft stock or hurt his draft stock? I'm going to say it's about stable. What this means is he's not getting an NFL opportunity, not with those times, but the change of direction drills were really good. The broad jump was solid. He's a guy, we hyped up Joel DeBlanco earlier. If you look at the PFF grading for whatever that's worth for the final two years of both of their careers, Jeffrey Kante Arku grades out higher than Joel DeBlanco did, albeit at a smaller school with not as high competition and a few less snaps. But this is a damn good football player. Now that he's not going to get an NFL opportunity, I think he's a lock to go in the first few picks of the CFL draft. Dunk, you reported that UBC offensive lineman Giovanni Manu has seven top 30 NFL pre-draft visits. Is that evidence that he'll get selected south of the border? Hell yeah, baby Shaq's going to the league, boys. <laughs> Seven top 30. Are you kidding me? This dude, it is an absolute freak. I mean that in the best way possible. 350 plus pounds jumping out the gym, running sub 540 yard dashes. It could be the first time in history that two players from one Canadian institution are selected in the NFL draft, boys. But, Stay tuned. But, but, really- but. How do we say his name? Because I confirmed with Giovanni. How do you say the name? No, but you didn't confirm in person. He, I think he a lot wrote, of that has to do with the phonetics of it. It's Manu. The emphasis is on the U, which means that, Dunk, you got egg on your face from last week. When you said that sounds like manure, okay? But you can also <laughs> say it like Manu is also emphasis on the U. Uh, Release the tapes, John Hodge. We demand the emphasis it. is on the U. That's what I'm saying. Continue. I think we can agree on that point. It's just how we say the first part. You kind of, I don't know what you call it, move your way into the ma newer part, and I say <laughs> ma new, <laughs> like ma, like mama, ma new. It's, the emphasis is still on the U, Manu. But the point is, it's not Manu. It's Manu. <laughs> this is a great pod, by the way, boys. We're doing a great job. <laughs> Manu. There's the emphasis on the U. We released an article counting down the top 10 oldest players in the CFL following the retirement of Chris Van Zyl. Which player were you most surprised to see on the list? I don't know about most surprised, but the player who I laughed at the most, uh, well, not at, you know what I mean? But the player <laughs> I laughed about the most was Dean Faithful, because, of course, he just finished his rookie year in the CFL. <laughs> Yet the global kicker is, in fact, one of the 10 oldest. So, again, not laughing at, but laughed about. That would be the player I, I guess I was I was most surprised to uh, to see. The BC Lions have signed offensive lineman Gene DeLance after he was released by the UFL's DC Defender. The former University of Florida standout started the team's recent home opener, but was ejected after he spat on an opponent. Ugh. Is it Gene or Jean? We'll have to we'll have to we'll have to reach out to him and Giovanni Manu for his opinion on how to say Gene DeLance. But JC, <laughs> do you think he'll spit on somebody in the CFL? God, I hope not. Every time we have a spigging story, it's just the most disgusting possible thing that that someone can do on Don't the Don't be field the next play. Duke Williams, okay, Delance? Don't, <laughs> Don't do it. it. Don't do it. I, I, I will point this out, though. Not only did he spit on an opponent, it also came when the team was trailing by a touchdown and in a first and goal situation. So he hurt his team badly there. And it was one of four penalties he committed on the day, two of which came and erased touchdowns. So there's a reason he was released essentially two days later. Wow. Hopefully he can clean all of he that up. He needs a guard on his face he mask. He does. Just so you avoid it completely. We need, spit we need to enact full COVID protocols for only him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Saskatchewan Rough Riders GM Jeremy O'Day told CKRM in Regina that new strength and conditioning coach Dan Farthing made the hair on his arms stand up when he interviewed for the job. Could he help reset the culture in Riderville? It's possible, but what I'm most curious about, is that actually real that your hair could stand up on your arm? Like that yes, would be of course. a cool trick. Of course. Really? 
well, Dunk, you don't have body That's... hair, so you wouldn't know this. But some people who do have body hair, yes, it stands up on end when when you feel like entranced by something. For those of you who didn't know, Dunk is smooth like a Ken doll all over. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jesus that'd actually be a great. TMI, that'd be a great nickname for oh Dunk. That'd be a great nickname, Ken doll. Uh... <laughs> No, uh, please. The Calgary Stampeders are adding legendary CFL coach Wally Buono. I don't know how he wasn't there before, but anyway, to the team's wall of fame after he helped them make four Grey Cup appearances from 1990 to 2002, winning twice. Was he worthy of that honor? Of course, of course he was. But Dunk, I know why he wasn't in because this team didn't induct anybody for 10 years. And that goes to show how this once flagship franchise lost its way for a time, which was reflected in the poor record they had last year. And kudos to new president Jay McNeil and the Alumni Association in Calgary for fixing this blatant oversight and bringing in arguably the greatest coach in Seattle history to be honored. It'd be nice if you didn't make him wait this long. But, hey, better late than never. Good job, Calgary, for fixing this. What I what I would describe to be a huge problem. Elks defensive coordinator Jason Shivers told 630 Chad in Edmonton that former first-round NFL draft pick Robert and Kem Diche has the right mentality oh, coming to the oh, CFL. Oh, Do you believe oh. that? And the- the N is silent, Hodge. How dare you mispronounce this? Robert. Name. I even said it earlier for you. Kemdiche. Well, next time. Say with me. Kemdiche, Kemdiche, Kemdiche. I, I could say Kemdiche, but I'll need Giovanni's opinion first on how to say Kemdiche. <laughs> and then, and then I will take your word for it. But do you believe it, Doug? Do you believe he's got the right mentality coming to the CFL? Well, actually, the, qu- oh, the question is. JC, for my me, apologies. Hodge. You, 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 that look, doesn't matter who you look so much alike. I believe he does. Don't skip me. Oh, wow. That's a that's a hell of a compliment there, Hodge. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am skeptical. I will say this. Uh, Kim Diche has had some flags about his effort level and work ethic throughout his career. Obviously battled some injuries in the NFL as well, which didn't help him out in that situation. But since he was last cut by an NFL team, he couldn't make it out of training camp in the USFL. Signed with the National Arena League's Jacksonville Sharks, although I can't actually find a record of him stepping on the field for that team. So I don't know if he just signed and and didn't play or, or what the situation was there and then signed with the XFL's DC Defenders and then backed out of that contract to come to Edmonton. To me, that doesn't indicate somebody who's extremely committed to being the best that they can be and reviving their football career, although I hope... Robert Kimdichie proves me wrong because he was a hell of a player at Ole Miss. The BC Lions have said they don't intend to re-sign receiver Lucky Whitehead. Is that a surprise to you, Dunk? And where do you think he could end up in 2024? It's not really a surprise based on what I heard behind the scenes and now what Rick Campbell and Neil McAvoy have said publicly because there was – such a long time between when they spoke about this and free agency happening that they weren't going to bring Lucky Whitehead back, or at least that he wasn't in their immediate plans for 2024. And talk about the receivers that they have. Obviously, Alex Hollins and Keon Hatcher needs to get healthy, and he'll probably be back, or could be back, I should say, at the back half of the year. But they got some dudes in that receiving core. Justin McKinnis, Javon McCoy. They really like Travis Fulham. JC, I know you've talked about him mm-hmm. a little bit on the podcast. So, It's hard to predict a team for Lucky Whitehead at the moment because I think that will be something that comes about if there's an injury in training camp or in the early part of the season unless there's a team out there that gets to training camp and they're like, you know, we just don't have enough juice in our receiving group or we feel like some of the young players that we thought were going to take a step aren't taking a step then that's the kind of team that I could see bringing in Lucky Whitehead who still has some game to him and he was I would say decently healthy last season. Hall of Fame CFL QB Henry Burris has been hired as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Florida A&M. Is that a good move for the two-time CFL MOP? It is. I'm sure that Burris would have loved to stay at the NFL ranks where he has been the last few years. And it's true that Florida A&M is at the FCS level rather than the FBS level, but... 
it is one of the top programs at that level. This is a team that went 11 and one last season, had a tremendous year playing uh, down south. And so I think that this is a great step for Henry Burris to take on a larger coaching position. And it's possibly setting a foundation for him to hold a similar job at a higher level, whether it's back in the pro ranks or at a higher level at the collegiate level. The Edmonton Elks have signed three, one, two, three, former first round CFL draft picks in Shane Richards, Hergie Mayala, and Hunter Stewart. Which of those three is the best signing? Well, you know, I love my big boys, but it's got to be Hergie Mayala here because this is a move that needed to happen because Curly Gittens Jr., their big offseason trade acquisition, potential 1,000-yard Canadian receiver, is likely not going to be ready for the first couple weeks of the season as he recovers from shoulder surgery. So Mayala is a guy who has starting experience, who can step in and take over that role as a competent placeholder. Shane Richards and Hunter Stewart, what this means as a whole to me is they've got their offensive line depth, They've filled that gap at receiver. They don't need either of those positions in the draft or at the top of the draft. Now they can go and get their linebacker at first overall, like we've been talking about all night. Former CFL head coach Greg Marshall, formerly of the University of Toronto, has been hired as the defensive line coach in Ottawa, the same city where he was once named the CFL's most outstanding defensive player in 1983. Is that a quality hire, Duck? It definitely is. The guy knows his defense and especially his defensive line play inside and out. But JC, you said we're recording this at night. Are you having some kind of issue with your brain today or what? <laughs> it, it was a verbal tick, Dunk. Just checking. It's it's all it's all it's night for me. Night in JC's world, wherever he is. <laughs> On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. We will see you. Did you go to the moon after the eclipse or something? Or what? <laughs> the dark side of the moon. Yeah. We will see you next week all, Wednesday all morning, for another all episode. All morning, okay? Well, it's afternoon. But admittedly, JC treats the night it's not, like it's I, day and the day like it's night. So it's it is, kind of oh, it's kind of night to him right now. <laughs> It's 11.59 a.m. It's not afternoon for yeah, me. Yeah, but that's Pacific, so really it's the afternoon. Yeah. We all live on Eastern time, bro. Come on, just admit it. Central, <laughs> I will say this. Central time, central weather is not the best, but central time is the best. Nothing's too early. Nothing's too late. You get the best of both worlds. Central time is the way to go. I could get on board with that. But I, but I will also caveat that by saying I think Sasky is smart to eschew daylight savings time, which is the worst. Yeah, the rest of Canada should do that as well. No kidding. Anyway. Topic yeah. for another day. Topic for, Enjoy the pro movie. Uh, probably, probably a topic for another podcast, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the moon.